Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this month's Shutter Magazine. I am Dustin Lucas and I'm going to be walking you through the three steps to protect your digital assets or to protect your ass, right? Whichever way you want to look at it. So it's kind of a crazy time, right? You might have heard um, or read online or maybe a fellow colleague of yours has had their network hacked, right? Or their computer system hacked. And I'm not talking about like you went to a website, it was one of those websites, we don't have to talk about it, and you got this virus and you had to take your computer to the geek squad and I'm not sure how this happened, but the DOD's involved, blah, 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 right? But I'm talking a little bit more about somebody accessing your network, holding your files or your server hostage and requesting you give them Bitcoin uh, because you don't have access to any of the now encrypted files, right? So this may have happened to you, you may have read it online, but it's not something you've necessarily had experience in or, or worried about. So I wanna talk about how you can protect that kind of stuff. Now, as photographers, losing all of your data tied to a hard drive crashing, right? Raise your hand, you've probably been there. Ugh, you had to send your hard drive off, get the platters removed, scanned, and then you get your raw files back and there's these really long file names. They don't make any sense, um, right? Back up your files, like don't be an idiot. Like back your files up. By the way, if you have a RAID hard drive, that's not just that's not your backup so, solution, right? That's a system. You have to have a backup, right? So we'll get to that. But you also might have a client that reaches out and asks for a raw file from a wedding you shot years ago because Uncle Louie, it's always Uncle Louie, passes away. And there weren't a whole lot of photos of Uncle Louie in the original reveal and delivery of these digital files. And the bride is heartbroken and wants to know maybe that was the last kind of formal uh, photographic experience or event that Uncle Louis was at. And with those photos, right? You'd love to be able to provide some photos of that guy. Um, everyone's just got time to run through an archive of old files, but you threw away the raws, part of your contract. Well, not my problem. I threw them away after 60 days. I mean, just think about that customer experience. and. Let's be a human for a moment and think about how important that moment would be to keep, right? So how are you archiving your files? Storage is cheap. So don't be a jerk and be like, nah, you know what, not my problem. Like storage is literally cheap. You could store the JPEGs. You don't have to store the raw files forever, but you literally could have those images kept on file for that customer somewhere offsite where it makes sense, right? So what I'm getting at here is Protect your digital assets, of course. Put a firewall, get some network security, get a secure network, whatever the hell that means. We'll talk about that, right? Um, I don't do IT, but I learned how to do it. I had a friend, I had to learn the process, and now I kind of have a junior IT position, right? Wearing a CTO hat. But I think it's important to understand networking. I'm gonna hire a professional, that's fine, we'll get there. File server. That's something you're going to be managing. I mean, file management, well, you know, my computer is hooked to a hard drive. I'm good. I bought a $5,000 computer. I'm set. Well, not exactly. So we'll get there. Getting a file server, step two. Step three in this, creating a file backup plan. Well, my files are backed up. It's fine. I shoot on two memory cards and then I put them onto two hard drives and one sits in my closet and one's hooked to my computer. I'm fine. Well, not really. There's a three, two, one backup plan, right? You want to have two on site, which you just covered would be fine. Two copies at your studio, which is fine. But you, you want to have one off site. Your studio is going to burn down. I'm not going to say it's going to burn down tomorrow. That gets kind of weird, but you need to have a backup plan. No pun intended for if something happens at your place, somebody breaks in, steals your stuff, right? Somebody hacks your system, holds your files ransom. Who gives a shit? You got them backed up on the cloud, right? You got them backed up at home. You got them at the studio and home, right? That's offsite, that's an option as well. But it's kind of silly to have stuff at home. There's cloud as an option as well. So we'll get to that. But high level, three steps to protecting your digital assets. We are gonna run through that. All right, so step number one to protecting your digital assets is going to be building a secure network. Now, like most of us, our background is in IT. What the hell am I doing securing my network? I have a internet modem, I have wireless router, uh, you know, I bought a, a firewall. Somebody told me to buy a firewall online and it's for a small business and uh, you know, my internet plugs into that and it kind of slows my network down, but I'm protected. I called my internet service provider, 
my fire, they have a firewall, I'm good. Mm, not exactly, right? So it's important to understand, and this is a little schematic here I have for you, to understand in a very kind of overview what we are talking about when we talk about a secure network. So the internet, wonderful place, right, uh, is out here. It's out here in this weird kind of inner space here. And then as internet comes into your studio, into your home, right, you want to put a firewall between the internet and all your internal stuff, whether that's your computer, whether that's your file server, which we'll get to, whether that's your printers, your all your devices connected to um, your all connected to the internet. But you want to put a barrier, a fence, right? You have a fence in your yard. You want stray dogs, stray animals coming in. You know, you want to put your, you know, protect yourself, right? So it's a firewall. It's a wall, right? Easy way to, to understand. So you're putting a barrier between you and the internet. Now, what that means is anything kind of bouncing in and out of the internet, it's going to protect and have these different layers and security. Now, from experience, I was uh, gracious enough to have a um, somebody whose background is in IT, and he helped me set up a server for uh, Evolve, where I work. So we had a very low grade, very kind of residential level firewall and we needed to get something commercial, right? So we got the Meraki system. So just to give you kind of an idea, and Meraki, and this isn't a, you know what, I'm here to sell a product. Cisco's gonna, Cisco's writing me a check right now. All these people are exciting. This might be an way over your needs, and needs are very important in this moment. You need a firewall. You don't absolutely need a Meraki one or Cisco, but you can get Ford in that. You can get different brand um, firewalls. Now, a firewall, again, to kind of give you an idea, is going to be this barrier. It's a device. So the internet comes in, Ethernet cable plugs into the firewall, firewall plugs into a switch. Okay, what the hell is a switch? Well, like on the back of your wireless router, um, right now, or wireless access point, your WAP, whatever you want to call it, it's going to have all these ports on the back. So internet comes in, it's connected to this, and all these ports can connect to a bunch of devices to have um, wired internet, right? So a switch is basically those ports without the um, wireless router, without the you know the the Wi-Fi, of course, that's wireless router's Wi-Fi. Um, it's just basically a wired. Um, it's a switch. It's a uh, one wire comes into the switch here, and then it basically is able to plug in multiple devices. So, again, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole of all that. Now, you might be thinking, okay, I don't have time to learn uh, secure network. What do I do? Do I outsource it? Of course, go outsource your network security. There are plenty of companies out there. You don't have the time. Outsource it. But what is important is for you to understand your needs. What you do as a business, and we'll get to the file part of this, but an outsourced IT guy is going to say, hey, I got your back. You don't need to back those files up. I got you. But he doesn't understand that with raw files, with as you're storing things on servers, that great, he can protect you from the outside world, but can he protect you from you? Your hard drive crashes. Well, what do you do? Well, I have an IT guy. I'll just call him. Well, the IT guy is going to go, I don't. I don't manage your storage, right? So you have to separate church and state. Secure network and firewall, that's IT. But when you start getting into servers and file servers and storage and backup, all that, that's going to be on your, you have to own that. You have to own that part. So hope that makes sense. Firewall, switch, other devices, blah, blah, blah. We'll get to storage next. Now, when it comes to how you are going to set up your system, and I just want to give you kind of a diagram for something I personally set up, right? So Files come in from the website, from customers for Evolve. They come in, they go to AWS, right? Or whatever your kind of cloud um, file transfer, whatever you use, Dropbox, Google Drive, all that kind of stuff. It's all kind of the same. Maybe you have photographers that are working for you, associate photographers, and they're uploading to Dropbox, right? Your kind of scenario would be, here's your associate photographer, they're uploading to Dropbox, and now it's coming into you, right? This is all you here, okay? So as it comes down here, I have our Meraki firewall between the internet, these files coming in, and the rest of our team right behind that. So it comes into a switch. Why do I have a switch? Well, because I have a 48-port switch that, you know, and set up in prior to setting this up, 
everyone was directly connected to the switch because this switch was connected to a storage device. Again, prior to me getting assistance from somebody in the IT world, I didn't know that we were vulnerable. I didn't know that we somebody could access our system very easily. So that's why I put that barrier between us and the internet. Hope this is all making sense. So as we come down here, we have a switch. This is our storage device. It's called Jupiter. It's OWC Jupiter Callisto Enterprise SAN system. And then we have these data sets, blah, blah, blah. None of this really matters to you. We'll get to this in a second, but you get the gist. This is our kind of topography um, of the entire system that we have. So it kind of goes out and it talks to things um, back and forth. So high level, this is what you're looking at. Now, what's the cool part about Okay, firewall, you can, when you create this system, you can access your server from home. So if you have a studio or if your files are somewhere else from where maybe you're traveling is a better option, right? Your files are all at home. You don't have a brick and mortar studio, that's fine. But all your files are at home. They're on your server at home in your basement, all cooled, blah, 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 blah. But you're traveling and you wanna access your server. Well, you can do that, right? So right now I'm accessed to the studio while at home. I'm at home talking to you right now in my comfortable space, right? So what I can do is I can access into local, right? Here's my public line, 10.0.3.140, which by the way, you're like, oh, he's giving everyone his IP address. Well, it doesn't matter, right? It's a local network. You have to be on our local network at the studio to even get access to this um, this. IP address. So, um, cause it's not a public IP address. I wouldn't be that stupid, right? <laughs> As we're talking about secure network. So I have a VPN going right here. So what we can do is we can access all of that information here directly in the studio. And I have access to our full server at home. Pretty cool, right? Now the connectivity is going to be slow. It's going to be based on my internet speed here. So if I go to like fast.com, and I do a quick speed check, it's gonna be about half the speed, roughly half the speed of what, um, what I would normally get, not on a VPN. So it's gonna slow things down. Now, access is great, right? It can see into a computer. If I want to screen share a computer, which I can, I can screen share to a computer that's physically at the studio, right? Well, that's kind of cool. So if you have a computer at home that's online or in your studio, I can access that. So my internet speed in the studio is a hell of a lot better, right? So that is very helpful, right? So I can also log into my server at the studio as well. And I have that same access into our file storage from home, all because I have a VPN set up, which says, hey, I'm physically at home, but it's a way to trick my, com the, uh, my computer, trick the system into thinking my computer is actually at work. So it changes my IP address or my home address, I, if you think about it that way, and it treats it as if I'm physically in the studio. So it's just a virtual way to um, be on the local network, high level. So another thing that a firewall and having a secure network would help you out with. So, you know, overall, probably have some questions, things like that, but this kind of gives you the gist of what we're talking about. Let's move on to step two, which is the file server storage, something you might be a little more excited about in this article. All right, so step number two is going to be get a file server for storage file server, storage, what does all this mean, right? So what I have set up for us, um, for, for our needs, is I've set up a enterprise level NAS, st like a uh, network access storage system, okay? So what that means is, is if since it's network based, it means I can access it from home, I can access it from across the world, doesn't matter. Now, accessing a server, transferring files, being able to manage all that stuff, right, there's, there's a lot of questions that are raised with that. Okay, well, if my storage is connected to the internet, you just told me I need to build a secure network. So now I've just exposed my storage to the internet. Well, your storage is exposed to the internet whether 
it's network attached storage or directly uh, directly attached, meaning like Thunderbolt, USB, right? USB-C, all these common interfaces that would be direct access storage, which that's what those are. Thunderbolt, direct um, USB, fire, uh, FireWire. <laughs> We don't have to go back there, but I mean, if you are still on FireWire, that's incredible. You made it this long, um, but that's one to one, one computer, one device back and forth. Now your computer can share to other computers, right? And kind of, you can create a fake network attached storage system. You can share that computer to other computers, but I've been there and working on Apple systems, by the way, I love Apple. I'm always working on an Apple computer. I'm always working within that system. But Apple sucks for file management. Let me repeat that. Apple is the worst at file management. Find a different option, right? Do not let a Apple computer connected physically to a hard drive be your network for file management. Use Linux. Use other proprietary softwares. There are better, more robust ways to have your files managed and ran. I found I found out the hard way, right? I resisted it for a long time. You know, you buy a really expensive Apple computer, you connect it to a really expensive G-RAID Thunderbolt 4, Thunderbolt 3 hard drive, and it's still garbage when more than three people connect to it, right? Because computers just aren't made for three people connecting to something, right, or larger. So there's enterprise-grade um, NAS systems. Now, we've talked about a few things, acronyms, DAS, D-A-S, Direct Access Storage, NAS, network attached storage. There's also SAN storage uh, area network, right? So what's based on your needs, you probably need something, you probably need more of like a NAS. And Synology is a great brand. Um, QNAP's a great brand. Um, OWC sells a Jupiter Callisto, um, which, uh, you know, is a little more kind of off the radar, but it's up there, it's enterprise, right? When you're entering anything enterprise, it's like, hey, this starts at ten thousand dollars. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa! I could have just gotten a hard drive at, uh, you know, Best Buy for eight hundred bucks, right? You just have to think about your needs in RAID, and we're not even there, right? But we're looking at a RAID calculator, right? All these things. So what's important is you need to get a storage device, okay? And you need to make sure if it's going to be NAS you need to get something that's 10 gigabit connection. Why? Well, if you're gonna have something that's like connected via the network, you wanna have the fastest connection between you and that device when you're on that network. And the faster connection would be like a 10 gigabit network, not a one gigabit, right? So let's kind of walk through what that looks like. So I am connected on this system via, right, local address here. This is me screen sharing into a computer at the office, right? The office is getting much faster internet than I am, right? 500 up and down. Now, if I want to access, right, what's my connection here? So my connection is the 1.0. So in my GUI here, right, another technical term, weird word for sure, um, here is my kind of breakdown here. So I have an MTU 9000, um, which means it's, a it's set up for a 10 gigabit connection. So let's jump into network settings. Now I have a Thunderbolt to 10 gigabit converter. It's Thunderbolt 2. Now if you don't have a 10 gigabit port on your computer, like you didn't upgrade to the 10 gigabit ethernet, which is fine. You can get a Thunderbolt converter, um, Thunderbolt 2, Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, converter to 10 gigabit, which is great. And then you can set that hardware up so that way it's faster. Here is why this is important, right? So I'm gonna run a little test for you here. So you can kind of see in real time what the difference is, okay? So I'm gonna go to production and I'm gonna run a Quick test here. Not bad, right? Obviously, the write speed's a little bit slower right now because something's probably going on in our system. But typically, this is around a thousand to a th between a thousand and a thousand um, between both. 
As I keep kind of running this, it's going to keep kind of running cycles. Not bad for a NAS drive. I mean, it's pretty damn good, um, to be honest with you. I'm going to show you kind of the difference between that and if I wanted to go to the local hard drive, right? So here's my flash storage, right? That's pretty close. Of course, that's local hard drive. Um, but I mean, the difference between that and let's see if I have another, um, I have an external hard drive here. Yeah, we can test that out. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's see how fast a, a, a USB three hard drive is just to kind of give you an idea of a real world testing here. And then I'll also show you what a one gigabit connection would look like um, connecting to the server just to kind of show you speed wise. So I'm gonna jump onto this. This is a USB two single three and a half inch hard drive. That's the speed that I'm getting read and write, right? It's gonna be maxed out at about what that disc can do. Now I'm still on the same, I'm still on hard drives on my NAS drive, okay? What's important to understand is because I have a 10 gigabit connection and it's a enterprise level server, that speed is so much faster, okay? Now to give you a perspective of what most people are connected at one gigabit, okay? Let's go ahead and we will run 10.0.3.140. What's going on here? Is it not? Oh, I put in too many hashtags or backslashes. That's why. Um, let's go ahead and Um, well, I gotta create a proper login here. Let me think here. Um, ooh, now I'm stumped. I gotta figure out what's a good login here. Let's see here. See. There we go. Yeah, you know, um, username and passwords. <coughs> They're always a uh, funny thing to remember. So now that we're connected, right? And keep in mind, the 10.3, this is my more, this is my public line, okay? So as I'm connected to this, I wanna show you the difference in speed. So this is a one gigabit connection, all right? Let's go ahead and click on production. I mean, it's crawling, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna max out at 120. That's a one gigabit connection, right? One gigabit is typically 1000 megabytes. Well, excuse me, gigabit is 100 megabit, megabytes, right? So it's not, gigabyte, it's gigabit. So you divide that by 10 and that'll give you your write, read and write speed. So just to kind of give you an idea, right? This is, we're at a one gigabit connection right now. And that gigabit connection is built out of, right? This right here, here's your gigabit speed, full duplex, right? All this stuff. This is typical for the internet. So I wanna make sure this is kind of a little more clear to you, right? So I'm getting a gigabit speed. When I want to reconnect to my 10 gigabit connection, my file transfer is going to be, well, in this case, it should be 10x, but you know, it also kind of depends on what's running on the system. That's crawling. Let's see here. Oh, I didn't actually connect to it. Hold on. Let me go ahead and rerun that. Disconnect. Connect. There we go. Now,
there's my connection, right? So I mean, it's immediately faster, which makes all the difference, right? But needs are important. Budget is the most important part, right? Can you afford a 10 gigabit connection? But this gives you an idea of what you need to do from a file server perspective. Connection, file server, you definitely want to, let's jump over real quick and talk about RAID, because we haven't done that yet. So from a file server perspective, right, you might want to start adding, you know, four drives, right, to understand the difference between RAID, um, different versions of RAID, what the hell is RAID, right? So I have a few diagrams here to help out, right? RAID 1 means it's going to write the same mirror, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take two drives. So if we go back to our RAID calculator, if you have two 12 gigabyte drives in RAID 1, this is important to see too, you're only gonna have access to 12 terabytes. Well, you might think, well, 12 plus 12 is 24. In a RAID 0 scenario, yes, RAID 0 or um, JBOD, which is just a bunch of disks, it's gonna take all of your hard drives and add them together and you just you get storage space, right? So it's important to understand the difference between RAID 0, which is just add the drives together, and RAID 1. RAID 1 means it puts your file here and it also puts your file there. Very protective, but also very slow. If you wanted to do a RAID 5, you need more disks, right? So if we get another 12 terabyte drive, you can see, wow, it's going to save your data here and it's going to create a third option, which is called a parity drive. So if one of these hard drives fails, you don't lose all your data. If two fail, you're screwed, right? So then you can create a RAID 6, which is not enough data. Now in a RAID 6 environment, you can have two drives fail and you're still good which is more secure than a raid five it's going to be slower you're getting half your capacity think about that 12 times 4 is 48. raid zero well it seems like more storage this is cheaper but this is protecting you right this is part of that protection it's creating a redundancy so raw file is here raw file is there this hard drive fails not a problem put in a new hard drive and it rebuilds itself and you don't lose any data. So that's important to know. Now RAID 10, difference of RAID 6, right? So RAID 10, RAID 6, similar, but the comparison would be showing that RAID 5, it's like a RAID 5 with two arrays here, okay? And RAID 10 is going to be your kind of best bang for your buck. It's gonna be the most kind of performance driven. So it's two drives built together and it's gonna use the power of both those drives running that. So like a RAID 5 is gonna use all these drives to create a parity disk. This is uh, kind of your more sound option, RAID 10. But a more kind of common option is RAID 6, four disks, parity, two disk failures. Here's your big difference, RAID 5 versus RAID 6. If you're toying between these two, RAID 6 makes sense but it all depends on how many disks you want to go with, right? So as you keep kind of adding these and whatever you decide, let me put a RAID 6 in place. Um, you have to have an even number for RAID 10, right? You can't have five drives and do a RAID 10, but you could do five drives and do a RAID 6. And that might be, you know, these are those things that you bought, you bought a five bay drive, a four bay drive, a six bay drive. Maybe you have, you know, in this case, <coughs> 12 um, bays, just keep going. But this kind of gives you an idea of what RAID means and things like that. And by the way, RAID is not a backup. And we're gonna get to that next. It's the biggest thing that you have to consider is RAID is not a backup. It's a single, this is your working drive. This is the one that you wanna have running your files in real time, but it's not the only backup you should have in place. All right, so step number three is going to be creating a file backup plan. Now, a 3-2-1 backup plan is the standard for any of your digital assets to be fully backed up. What that means is one, two, three. Two on-site, one off-site. So on-site means local hard drives, NAS hard drives, anything that is physically in the same place as you. The third backup is going to be cloud or FTP or whatever you want to call it, right? It's got to be off-site. It has to physic, 
physically, well, you want to call cloud physical or not, you want it to exist somewhere outside of your place, outside of where you're working. So hope that makes sense. Now, common offsite um, storage would be like Backblaze, Dropbox, Google Drive. Um, you have different uh, AWS, different kind of cloud-based storage option um, for your offsite backup. Now, this is pretty straightforward. So when you bring your files in to Lightroom, right, you have the option to back up your files, right? You could create a, uh, you could use a um, carbon copy, um, carbon copy cloner, which is a pretty awesome software that you could create schedules or backups. Uh, and it's actually a really good software. So if you were to use carbon copy to copy, carbon copy to um, schedule a backup, when you import your files from your memory card and you bring them onto your main hard drive, you could set up a daily backup to backup from one NAS server to cold storage or your photo storage. Um, and your photo storage could just be a cheap RAID zero, um, you know, multi-drive, just kind of cold storage. Like it sits there, it's offline, it's not all, it's not running all the time. That's cold storage. That makes a little more sense. That would be something that you would want to have run. Um, if we jump over to here, um, kind of in the background. So our this here is the Jupiter, um, but what you would um, kind of want to have set up here is a, you know, if you wanted to have the Jupiter run to backup, like a backup RAID drive or something like that, RAID zero, right? Just to kind of keep things simple. Uh, and I think this diagram is super helpful. So. Um, if you'd want to have, you know, in something between here, um, we could add in a kind of go between and, you know, carbon copy cloner. And this is going to be, you know, file. Photos, RAID zero, carbon copy, you know, this is just going to be scheduled. All right, just to kind of add something in here. So files come in, blah, 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 hit Jupyter, um, or maybe you're coming on a, you know, RAID drive. This is the, the main drive, our NAS, and then carbon copy would schedule backup to here. Now this drive is only online it's there's not nas drives in it I mean, it would be something that would just be cheap that would be sitting there accessible if needed but this is what's running all the time this is what you want a little more enterprise ready but what i'm getting at is you want to make sure that you have a good backup plan now i think from an archive perspective what makes sense is if you deliver your files to a customer and then what do you do with them after 60 days you deliver the files? You delete them, do you post, do you export JPEGs for everything, post that somewhere, does it go to the cloud? I mean, I, do you take your files to the bank, right? You fill up a hard drive, goes to the bank, like you might laugh at that, but I mean, that's an offsite um, storage strategy as well. But you, I think it's silly to get rid of the RAWs forever. Um, and here's why, right? Bride's gonna come back, want that file of Uncle Louie, you didn't deliver on the day. I mean, that's, that's something to keep in mind. I mean, using, a, a kind of fine print in the contract or doing something like that to kind of protect yourself, I think is important, don't get me wrong, but kind of becomes lazy when it comes to storage. I mean, you could store, I mean, are you gonna shoot so many files that you have 100 terabytes of un unused data somewhere? I mean, I, I just think it's negligent to not keep those files, at least JPEG. I mean, export them out, low res DNGs, who cares? Keep the smart previews, um, you know, above all, something low res. You don't need high res files forever. I mean, that's an option, smart previews in Lightroom. So again, you can archive those files, but I think what it makes sense is, what I'm getting at is when you deliver those files, keep them on site for a year. I think that makes sense. Offload them to cold storage or off site, low res, maybe even low res raw files um, or something like that. Um, and keep them off site so you have a backup, you have access to them and make sure your files um, if they're not renamed, but in a way that you can easily access them quickly. So um, there's different programs to catalog that kind of stuff, but you get what I'm saying. So backup, three, two, one, 
and an archive plan. I think that's going to be uh, massive in your structure um, for protecting your digital assets. All right, so I hope you made it through those three steps to protect your ass or your digital assets, right? Um, it's really important to make a plan. And what I like about these lucid charts or whatever kind of overlay you want to look at, um, these, what's this? Click X off that. I don't really care about that. What's going on? A little pop up here, and it's distracting me. Um, it's really important for you to kind of create a um, topography or topology, whatever you want to call it, um, of your plan of what your layout is. I think uh, using something like this kind of helps you diagram what you want to do. Now, in making a plan to protect your digital assets, you might not have, you know, the 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 know-how to build a secure network. Outsource it. Find an IT team, but make sure when they come in, they they're not going to understand your business. They're not going to understand your business rules, what you do. You have to know those things and you have to make sure you're advocating for that stuff. So it makes sense when they come in and I've had IT consultants come into the business and they literally act like they don't give a shit about what our business is, but they know everything about vulnerabilities in the business and they haven't listened to anything I've said. They don't understand what I do. So push for that. Be an advocate for those things. Um, you know, don't let somebody, don't let a professional walk in and tell you, hey, here's your problem. Um, listen, like, I mean, you have to kind of understand um, the backbone of that um, and take that with a grain of salt. So with getting a secure um, or create a, um, you know, a firewall or a, a secure network team, an IT team, you also probably want to look into a storage team. So different companies are going to have different support levels and things like that. But if you pay for support, it'd be good to have a, a storage team that has your back. So you can have the storage team involved with the security team, involved with your dev person that may be overseas. And so that way you're the project manager, right? You're the business owner. You're working with these different microservices, these teams, and you're you know the quarterback, right? You have to make sure you're pushing the team down the field. You're not everyone's scattered, you know, running backs, arguing with the wide receivers, arguing with the center. I mean, you have to run the team, right? You are the manager, you're the quarterback. Make sure you're running those teams correctly. So it's very important, regardless if you don't have the time to do the network security, you don't have the time for all this other stuff, make the time to run the file server, make the time to manage all of this stuff because it's your livelihood, it's your business that you're exposing. So all those things are important. I hope this kind of comes through a little bit more direct. I don't give you like a schematic of what I do or kind of in theory of what's happening. You saw the... Um, File storage speed test, you you know, kind of high level different options. The Meraki firewall, you could go with Fortinet, Netgear, right? Another brand, other things out there, whether you, whether you want to go unmanaged or managed, you have to kind of look at your top line budget. Do you have two to $5,000 to put into this? Do you have, you know, but you also have to think about it and say, well, I don't have $3,000 to put into budget for your secure network, but you're also exposing your six figure business by not figuring out how to put $3,000 of expenses into a secure network, it's just kind of silly. Uh, so it may be something you wanna work into your expenses um, to your benefit, of course. But high level, you wanna enlist professionals where it makes sense. You just have to understand the system. And again, those professionals go away, somebody else comes in, you also kinda of have to understand the schematic. You have to fill somebody in too whether it comes to website dev work, when it, whether it comes to um, file storage, you go to another storage company from Synology, from QNAP, you kind of have to understand what you had, what you're moving to, and understand those kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, so I hope all this makes sense. It's not as glorious as photo editing and Lightroom stuff like I normally do, but I think it's really important and kind of a really, really, a really negated part of most businesses is the protecting of the digital assets. So I hope you guys learned something. Thanks for tuning in. Um, hopefully we'll see you at Shutterfest.